and finance industry has seen an unprecedented growth over the past two decades, from setting up India's first MFI in the form of the Self-Employed Women's Association, or SEVA, in Gujarat, which established the SEVA Bank in 1974, with a handful of players offering self-help group and joint lending group loans to a matured market, providing credit to over six crore borrowers, the industry has come a long way. When the pandemic hit and the country had to put a break on virtually all activities, the microfinance industry was perhaps one of the worst hit, with many of its customers losing jobs overnight. At a time when the Reserve Bank of India is proposing a roadmap for converting small and payment banks into universal banks to push banking to the unbanked regions to achieve financial inclusion, does microfinance remain relevant? Can smaller NBFC MFIs compete with deep-pocketed banks with their vast reach? Can the industry grow when its customers are facing severe losses? To what extent are the government support schemes helping? Well, let's go across to my colleague Ritu Singh for a quick snapshot of where the industry finds itself. Profit and philanthropy sound like they wouldn't really get along, but they do make for a good marriage going by the success of microfinance institutions. India is now one of the largest microfinance markets in the world, with the sector growing at an average rate of over 40% until very recently. According to data from SIDBI, the microfinance industry witnessed a growth of 27% over the previous year in the quarter ending March, and the total outstanding portfolio of this industry that stood at 2.28 lakh crores. Now, if you look at the market share, the microfinance industry is still dominated by banks, which have almost a 40% market share and a portfolio of over 90,000 crores, followed by NBFC MFIs with a 33% market share and a small finance bank with an 18% market share and so on. If you look at the number of borrowers, again, NBFC MFIs have 2.6 crore unique live borrowers, closely followed by banks, small finance banks, NBFCs, and so on. Uh, at the NPA levels, across lender categories, banks, small finance banks and not-for-profit MFIs have bad loans of less than the overall industry levels on average. The overall number is about 0.87%, still less than 1%. But to get to where it is today, the industry had to go through several shocks, starting with the Krishna crisis of 2006, the Kolar crisis, the big one, the Andhra Pradesh crisis that changed the face of the MFI industry, the big shocker in the form of demand monetization and now the COVID-19 pandemic. So India's microfinance sector has been pushed to prove its pliability time and again with each crisis bigger than the last. With this current pandemic, the microfinance industry has been one of the worst hit with most of its customers losing jobs overnight. For instance, during the first quarter of this year in terms of the number of loans dispersed by NBFC MFIs, that was down by 97% compared to the same period last year and in terms of the value of of loans that was also down 96% in the first quarter of this year when there was a complete stop in activity. According to an RBI study, the collection efficiency of microfinance securitization pools fell from 83% in March to sharply to just about 3% in April 2020 before it slowly began to recover, but it is still not back to the pre-COVID peak. In RBI's own words, COVID-19 is perhaps the biggest tail risk event for the microfinance sector in a very long time, but with every crisis comes an opportunity from, for improvement, and if history is anything to go by, the sector is likely to bounce back sooner than later. Thanks very much, Ritu. And to take that conversation forward, joining me here on The Making, I have with me Manoj Nambiar, the CEO of Arohan Financial Services, also with us, HP Singh, the Chairman and Managing Director of Satin Credit Care Network, and Rajat Varma, the MD and Head Commercial Banking at HSBC India. Gentlemen, many thanks for joining us. Mr. Nambiar, you know, let me start by asking you uh, for an outlook on where things currently stand for the MFI industry. You know, if 2020 was challenging because of the COVID pandemic, it wasn't as if 2019 was any better. You had the elections, you had floods, you had all kinds of other events uh, which constrained the growth of industry. But given where we find ourselves nine months into the pandemic, where are collections, where are disbursals, what's the state of play? Well, Shireen, thank you for having me, and appreciate the, the the you know the opportunity. Let me let me let me start by saying that an industry today which uh, has almost sixty million end beneficiaries and thereby impacting the life of almost two hundred and fifty three hundred million citizens in our country, right, is mature and of a certain size. We today bring credit to that segment of society which is deprived of formal access to finance. 
and we are very proud that the RBI has created this this particular set of entities, which today are able to do this kind of effort. Uh, as an industry, uh, apart from the reach that I mentioned to you of 250 to 300 uh, million lives, uh, we bring credit to them at their doorstep at rates which are very very fine uh, as compared to the rates that they will have to sort of borrow from from the other sources. And the fact that the industry, which was less than 10,000 crores in 2011, yeah. today has matured to a level of 2,40,000 crores in terms of portfolio outstanding. Mm -hmm. Comparing that with the SAG program of about a lakh crores, you have almost 3,40,000 crores as credit to the segment. And even at this supply, we believe that the market is only uh, one third penetrated. So you can understand, given the priority of financial inclusion from the government of India, the progressive policies of RBI, uh, and the fact that there is two thirds of the market yet to be uh, sort of tapped, the kind of potential which is there for growth. Now, you're absolutely right uh, that this is a business which is grounded, and to that effect, uh, anything which happens on the ground, whether it's a natural calamity, an unfortunate natural calamity, or a political uh, activity, does have impact on the business. The latest one, obviously, is the COVID pandemic. Uh, as you know, we all locked down in the last week of March, and there was the RBI moratorium, which was available initially till May, which mm -hmm. then got extended till August. Uh, as I was explaining to you, uh, from September onwards, we have opened up. Uh, the normal aging process has started. So you have three months, September, October, November, where it's been sort of back to uh, business as, as, as usual. We okay. do find stress at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, livelihoods have got impacted. But the good news is that every passing week, every passing month is actually better than the previous. Okay. So as of today, when I talk to you, we have still not returned to what this sector is famous for, which is the 99% plus collection efficiency. But I can safely tell you that people are in the 90 to 95% kind of village. And, yeah. uh, uh, you know, like we discussed, I think December, Jan, this particular year, by February, March, I think we should be back to where we started. Uh, I mean, you know, or rather where we were uh, in Jan or Feb this year before the COVID pandemic. Okay, so you're hoping that uh, a normalcy will return uh, sometime early part of 2021. But, you know, you talked about the underpenetration and the headroom for growth. So let me ask you whether you believe that you're on track uh, to meet that target of reaching 5 million households uh, by 2025. You have a target of uh, 25,000 crore rupees of portfolio by 2025 for Arohan. You want to impact the lives of over 20 million people. Uh, do you feel uh, confident to be able to achieve that by 2020? No, certainly, Shireen, uh, the year 2021 would certainly be a blip year, right? So I think uh, if you if you ask me the five-year plan that, that we were working on, uh, on the numbers that you just mentioned, uh, yeah. probably it might get extended by a year. But the geographies in which we operate, which are severely underpenetrated, uh, you know, fairly low-income states, uh, and the kind of uh, framework that we've already set in place with the distribution, the management team, the IT enablement, and the sort of capital raising ability that we have, I think we should be able to reach that plus maybe a year. Okay, so it might be 2026 if all goes as per the visibility that you currently have. Uh, so it might be extended by a yeah, year or so. Yeah. Let me get Mr. Singh to comment on where he sees uh, uh, the industry as well as the business uh, for Saturn Credit Care. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Nambiar was talking about collection efficiency being in the range of between 90 to 95 percent. I, I think your reported number is 94 percent, Mr. Singh. Uh, take me through asset quality issues that you're currently facing, uh, uh, you know, post the moratorium uh, being lifted in August. What is the situation uh, as far as business is concerned? And also, uh, you know, what one is seeing playing across large businesses uh, and, of course, when we talk to banks, is that the rural exposure, uh, that seems to be far more resilient than urban. What's the anecdotal data that you're getting from the MFI business? So, uh, thank you so much, Shireen. And I think as what uh, uh, Manoj rightly said, I think, you know, it's the blip is... Uh, the, uh, the 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 blip is on uh, on a positive note. Uh, in fact, if we really look at uh, during the uh, uh, lockdown period, as such, you know, uh, the collection efficiencies were around uh, sixty percent odd. Uh, mm -hmm. But yes, uh, post the moratorium, uh, once uh, normalcy started returning back, the lockdowns uh, were getting eased off. Uh, the collection efficiency came in the ninety percent bracket. Uh, in fact, for us, uh, when we reported ninety four percent, there's been an uptake uh, from there on. 
onwards uh, for the uh, uh, months which are uh, November and previous to that. Okay. Uh, the other thing which is probably very uh, prominent is that uh, you know all of us uh, technically MFIs are uh, based in the uh, rural space. You know, uh, like we have about seventy six percent of our portfolio portfolio which is in the rural space. Hmm. Now over there, what has happened is that uh, the agri activities as well as the harvesting, uh, you know, has probably been very, very. Uh, uh, in fact, it's probably one of the record years as such. You know, hmm. uh, barring whatever is happening to the farm law bills and everything, you know, that is something which probably we'll also have to take into account, which is happening in Punjab and Haryana. But still, uh, leaving aside that, the fact of the matter is that the way businesses got impacted in the urban space and hmm. the rural economy, which is purely a domestic economy and it's probably localized to a to a large extent the hmm. income levels don't get so erratic and uh, they are always positive so for hmm. us the collection efficiency looking at all that space is going to be a pretty big, uh, positive onwards you know but if we say at it you know for us to reach 99% yes that would probably take us another 3 to 4 months to reach in over there hmm. uh, q4 would be probably be a very stable quarter for all of us okay including that there will be disbursements which are picking on now. In fact, mm. if you look at the uh, disbursement graph also for uh, uh, the various MFIs which are there, uh, mm. month on month there is a positive increase over there. Uh, we are back to the uh, pre-COVID uh, levels now in terms of our disbursements. Uh, this yeah. month, you know, we probably have closed on to that. Uh, but the growth pattern will only probably start somewhere in the, uh, uh, somewhere in the Q4 or maybe in the first quarter of 2021. You know, that on this, if I if I can just uh, interrupt you there on disbursements, as you said that you're probably back to the pre-COVID levels. But if I were to take a look, for instance, at your numbers year on year, uh, disbursals are down almost sixty-five percent. Uh, so, do you anticipate a return to that kind of uh, growth? Uh, and how soon do you anticipate that? So, for us, the the previous years have been that you know we did a lot of process reengineering, you know, in in our company, you know, and that was probably you know somewhere which we have been uh, really looking at to uh, to bring it to this uh, field as such, you know. Now, just just give, to give you an example, you know, I think you know we are the, probably the first ones to do psychometric analysis of our microtransporters. Yeah. That was something which was unheard of. Now, my, doing a psychometric for uh, a rural uh, borrower technically is very difficult because for them, you know, uh, most of them probably are illiterate. They are not able to uh, read or write. So what we used to do that we made a pictorial graph on the basis of which we could do a psychometric analysis of that. Okay. Now that process reengineering as well as a lot of technology which we've been able to bring in, you know, EKYC, uh, cashless mm -hmm. disbursement. Uh, in fact, you know, we've also launched our uh, customer service app. Now today, mm -hmm. our uh, borrower can technically uh, pay online uh, through the mobile yeah. phone. And yeah. that is a very big achievement for that segment of the society. But mm. yes, having said that, I think you know that ease is also contributing towards how we are able to actually disburse uh, far more, you know, quickly as compared to what we used to do earlier. And mm. that probably is also one of the key areas which are giving us maybe that impetus in growth and disbursements. You know, earlier mm -hmm. I can probably say it, and Manoj would know it. Earlier, our TAT used to be close to about eight to ten days. Now the TAT yeah. has reduced to probably one day. In fact, if you really look at it, you know, we can probably sign off and say that we can, you know, actually disperse in two minutes. Yeah. So that's that's how, you know, probably the strong the tech is working on in terms of, uh, you know, growth and uh, techno and disbursements. Absolutely. And I will talk a little more detail uh, uh, about the use of technology and leveraging technology. And that certainly is something that uh, uh, MFIs like yours are uh, banking on for uh, disbursals as well as collection. But Rajat, uh, you know, one of the issues that both Mr. Singh as well as uh, Mr. Namia raised were the opportunities and the headroom for further growth. And consolidation perhaps is being seen as one of the drivers for that. Uh, what do you make of the metrics of the business as well as the landscape going ahead? So to quote what you said earlier, Shireen, that the industry has come a really long way from Ilaban in 1974. And the last two, you know, what Manoj said about 2011 and uh, and now it's a remarkable change in the industry, almost three and a half lakh crores in it. So, and when you think of the massive numbers at play and you say that, okay, two thirds of the market is still under penetrated, uh, you know, that metric itself tells you that there is a model uh, that is scalable uh, and the story is not yet done. So that's how I'm looking at the industry. I'm actually very, uh, you know, inspired by the success of the industry in the last yes. 10 years. I know there've been ups and downs, 
you know, and they've been setbacks uh, for various reasons. Uh, but I think the industry has shown a level of maturity which it did not have in 2010 and 11 during the AP crisis. Uh, so I'm actually quite positive on the momentum and the contribution that it has to make on a society like India's. And let's not forget that they are serving uh, rural women uh, and that and, and rural, the empowerment of rural women is uh, is uh, absolutely fundamental to uh, you know equitable growth in this uh, in this country. Now you spoke about consolidation. Uh, now I, I think I'm kind of conflicted here because I feel that small MFIs have also had a great role to play networking with the society at the ground level. And when you make everything as big brother and you know institutionalize everything, then you may lose some of that. So I believe there is, it's inevitable that like all other industries, there'll be a level of a consolidation. But I do believe this is an industry where the local touch and feel does play a large part. Mm -hmm. And it would be a pity if the industry uh, loses that touch, because that is the touch which is keeping, uh, you know, which is which has Manoj and HP talked so proudly about the 1%, et cetera. I yeah. As an outsider, uh, I would say that the touch and feel of that industry has been uh, a pivotal has had a pivotal role to play in that technology mm. can facilitate a lot of things mm. uh, but i would say that inevitable that consolidation happens but at the same time we must not lose the human touch yes i think that that is imperative especially since the mission is to serve the underserved and that perhaps is best addressed by the niche players by that local touch and feel that you spoke of but mr nambir on the point of consolidation some degree of consolidation may be inevitable uh, as rajat was pointing out but i also want to put this in the context of the aspiration to emerging uh, as a bank. Uh, now with what the Reserve Bank has put out by way of the internal working group's recommendations, what do you make of those? And do you believe that that is perhaps going to be uh, the path to more growth? Or do you believe that that will in fact uh, contradict the very purpose for this business coming into being? No, I think Shirin, it's actually a continuum, right? So there is nothing like uh, there is a full stop. These are all sort of commas on the way. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I mean, I always keep saying that in the financial inclusion domain, if you look at it today, you can start very small with a Section 8 company, mm -hmm. right? Then convert it based on your capital to an NBFC, yeah. become, let's say, an NBFC MFI, which obviously has far more stringent uh, sort of guidelines attached to it. Right. And then over a period of time, apply to become a small finance bank and maybe even become a universal bank in the process. Mm -hmm. So I think it is the runway which is available. Now, mm -hmm. what at what point of time... Do you press what lever and where do you take the turn essentially is left to the individual company, to the shareholders there Let's and the size and shape that you're at. 14 years into this business, what point of the runway do you find yourself at? So if you if you look at the RBI working group report itself, Shireen, it talks about NBFC is greater than 50,000 crores looking at becoming a bank. Yeah. Right. So the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, at 10,000 crore, I mean, at 1,000 crores, you become let's say relevant at 5000 crores you become let's say a little bit bigger you're still medium from the indian context yeah. at 10000 crores you have some standing right it is important to to uh, fully optimize each segment of this journey hmm. and then take that turn hmm. right a bank is a bank and nbfc is an nbfc all of hmm. them have different roles to play hmm. you have some positives here you have some yeah. some things which you need to sort of watch out for at right. the end of the day, it's about what you as the promoter group and the management feel appropriate given your customer franchise, hmm. right? At where would you like to press that button, hmm. right? I would say as far as we are concerned, uh, first, fully optimizing the space that we are in today as an NBFC MFI, reaching a certain scale and, and size of that 10,000 crore plus, and then looking at the landscape and seeing what is that turn that we need to take. Yeah. Right. At this point of time, our focus is very clear. We want to be an NBFC MFI and we want to grow in the sector. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's the focus at this point in time. And, uh, you know, I would imagine that uh, in order for the growth to be sustainable, that laser sharp focus is uh, is essential, is required. Mr. Singh, what, what about you? Uh, you know, where on the runway do you find yourself and what is the aspiration from here on? You've got what we've done, uh, yeah. uh, so what we've done uh, uh, technically is that you know uh, after the demonetization, uh, we thought that being just 
having a monopolistic product with us you know was kind of challenging you know in case in terms of any crisis which comes in so what we did we actually branched out and created subsidies uh, for housing finance at that too housing finance in the rural space yeah uh, and we created an msme uh, uh, company again you know as a subsidy which was again looking at the rural space you know so what we've done technically and that's what our aspiration is uh, when we become either a bank or we still remain as an nbfc mfi mm -hmm. but the mm -hmm. subsidies of ours will branch us out into from the microfinance product but that purely in the rural space you know so what we've done is microfinance is you know let's say up till about 50000 rupees msme yeah. which we are going through our subsidy mm -hmm. company is graduating for microfinance borrowers who have actually taken a microfinance loan so we've hmm. seen the credit history uh, now the aspiration which for them is to probably you know have uh, more credit in terms of you know scaling up their business and that is hmm. why you know we are doing about 1 lakh to about 3 lakh in the msme uh, you know company of ours and for people for for borrowers who actually required you know housing finance even in the rural space like you know uh, constructing a, a a couple of floors or maybe looking at you know various rooms or maybe hmm. adding on to maybe you know maybe another uh, you know uh, you know uh, a building right next to theirs you know basically or yeah. creating toilets and all that you know now that goes through the affordable housing part of ours you know rajat mm -hmm. what do you see as as the pros and cons as mr nambiar was pointing out and each uh, individual uh, entity will have to weigh those pros and cons uh, you know one aspect of course the, the big plus would be in terms of the cost of funding the cost of finance uh, but what is it that people will have to consider before they decide to take the next leap yeah i think uh... You know, when I look at the the stats on a more macro basis, Shireen, you, uh, you've got, uh, you know, you, you're only one third of the way through. If that were to be considered as a true data point, then this sector itself and the adjacencies HP was talking about microfinance plus plus. Hmm. So the adjacencies around microfinance should be enough and more runway for an institution which is, let's say, three, four, five thousand crores of uh, asset book today. My personal kind of take on this is sure at a different, you know, this is a call that shareholders and management will take. Yeah. But as an industry, I think there is uh, a very strong business case as at an industry level mm -hmm. to say that this is our core and we should stick to our core because not because it not only because it's good for society, but yeah. also because it seems like a really good business model. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's enough for us and it, there is enough. To my mind, the issue arises that how do you get the cost? Of, you mentioned the cost of deposits or the yeah. capital, etc. And that could become a constraint. Hmm. Uh, if that becomes a constraint and you want to go to a larger set of depositors, yes, I can understand that. My own feeling, though, is that as ESG investment increases hmm. and as I mean, we, we've gone through uh, the stress uh, after, right after you know demonetization in cash and now COVID for six or seven months. Now, if this is not stress testing, I don't know what stress testing is. Uh, and therefore, it seems to me that capital is, at least for mid to large sized MFIs, not yeah. necessarily a constraint today. Yeah. And therefore, for me, it looks like sticking to the path. Hmm. I mean, I'm not, this is not advice to two stalwarts on the screen hmm. on their companies, but more generically about the industry. I think sticking to that path of growth because you have more simply because you have more than enough runway. Uh, yes, I would imagine that that's certainly not what you would like to see happen. But uh, uh, Mr. Nambiar, you know, to pick up on the point that Rajat was making in terms of capital not being a constraint for the larger NBFC MFIs like you, I, I think you've raised what debt of about 4,000 crores uh, uh, recently. Uh, but from an industry perspective, how much of a concern is that uh, today? Uh, and more importantly, from a regulatory architecture, regulatory framework perspective, where do you believe the support is required? What do you believe are the impediments to future growth? We really need to work hard in terms of ensuring that the credit discipline that we are mm. trying to create at the bottom of the pyramid is very strong. Mm. That is one. Second is, I would say, the KYC uh, issues that we've been uh, discussing. So the RBI is very, very uh, helpful. We've been, in fact, uh, talking to them about allowing us eKYC like the banks are allowed because RR as a document post the privacy uh, sort of judgment yeah. became sort of inaccessible to us, right? The third, I would say, like HP mentioned, the fact that most of us today, 100% of our disbursements today are cashless. Hmm. We would like to make even the repayments cashless, hmm. right? On repayments, we are in varying stages. Some are at 20, 30, 40, 50%. 
we would like to make the entire repayment process cashless so that the dream essentially is that we are able to get into a especially after the pandemic get into a low touch model rather than the fairly high touch model that we have today while we continue to keep the customer relationship intact keeping that uh, mission and that goal in mind uh, mr singh let me ask you uh, continuing with the conversation around regulation and i know one of the demands of industry is for harmonization or uh, common uh, standards across the industry uh, if you can specify what the ask is there uh, and also you know when we were talking about uh, uh, the headroom for growth i've been taking a look at a lot of analysts who are tracking the sector and they believe that the current valuations don't fully factor in the ability to deliver superior return ratios so you know how much further uh, can we expect uh, headroom there so growth i think you know that's not a challenge uh, you know if you really look at it you know but you know it has to be a growth uh, which probably has to be factored in with various parameters attached along with it you, know? you just can't go you know maybe you know with a 100% growth you know but a decent growth of 40 50% uh, you know as was being done earlier i think there's yeah. room for that for the next few years as such you know so that is one of the things you know in terms of i think you know uh, the regulatory environment which is there you know i think you know uh, more than that, it's the social environment which which is there. I think regulatory has been looked after by MFIN and you know uh, guys like Manoj, you know, which are looking at uh, the RBI to really look at it. But I I think you know the the basic challenge which comes up is there the which is the interference of the uh, of the local uh, you know bodies and maybe you know the uh, the political class which probably gets into it during the times of elections or maybe you know somewhere or where you're talking of loan waivers and other stuff you know. And I think you know that is the most important part, which probably has to be looked in if uh, real growth has to be seen uh, in this sector. So the yeah. room is there, but I think mm. you know more than the regulatory challenge, which I think probably will be taken care. Of, uh, it's more the uh, the social challenges which I have to be probably encountered and uh, looked at. You know, which is which is probably uh, the case, which is e even these days. You know. Oh, absolutely. I think that is something that the MFI industry uh, has uh, learned to cope with grudgingly, albeit, and it causes all kinds of volatility and, uh, of course, creates an uncertain environment. Rajat, let me start by asking you for wrap-up comments now. Uh, you've heard what both Mr. Nambiar and Mr. Singh have had to say about the state of play. Uh, and as we pointed out, the top 10 states account for almost 83% of the total MFI loans uh, as of March 2020. So, uh, you know, penetration growth the opportunity is there what would you think the industry needs to be most mindful of right so just as uh, just as wrap up comments first uh, shireen i'd say that look this is an industry which is which is not as fetid as fetid as it should be in my view and i'm not saying because my friends are on this call but i i generally believe so uh, because it's come a really long way and is uh, serving uh, this this country really well and it's done that with discipline now you know you go to I, I've been on panel etc where uh, people talk about wholesale lending and the and the enormous amount of restructured loans and bad debts largely in the uh, large corporate space and you see that this is clearly an inverted pyramid uh, so uh, as a uh, as a very high level comment I would say that this industry has shown discipline and has shown good growth it has several challenges especially the ones around ecosystem which HP kind of spoke about uh, but it the biggest thing to remember about this industry is that it has legs you know it has a, uh, it has a roadway a runway for tremendous growth in times to come and if we were to play the regulations and the encouragement to the sector in the right way uh, it has enormous potential uh, simply because of the base base impact of the opportunity that is present in this country Yes, it certainly will follow. Stay true to your purpose. That's the message coming in there from Rajat Misanambir. Wrap up comments from you, uh, uh, especially in the context of uh, the point that Rajat made of learning lessons from the past to ensure uh, that A, you stick to the purpose and you do so with the financial discipline that is required. Uh, what 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 would you say? No, Shireen, I would say we are a sector which is learned from every crisis. Right, and we have ensured that the takeaways from each crisis, whether it was the episode which happened in 2010-11, or let's say the natural calamities that we've gone through, or the 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 uh, uh, you know the sort of challenges that we faced because of cash during the demonetization phase. Now, of course, the COVID pandemic. I would say the sector has been very very uh, diligent in terms of picking up the the uh, the learnings 
and sort of implementing that. And that is the reason why, uh, you know, I would say that from less than 10,000 crores in 2011 to, to 2 lakh 40,000 crores is no mean achievement. Mm-hmm. And that has been made possible because of the policies of the, of the RBI, uh, because of the debt funding which is made available from banks like Rajat's, uh, and the fact that we have a very, very uh, stringent and a very disciplined process of lending to even new fresh customers in a group format, right? Uh, so that uh, they're able to access formal finance rather than the informal finance, which is which is what they need to sort of depend on. Uh, and uh, the fact that you are lending mostly to women also explains the, the low delinquency uh, rates that the industry is, uh, has able to has been able to deal with but uh mr singh let me give you the final say now you know mr nambiar said that he's pushing further by about a year the target of uh, getting to twenty five thousand crores uh, uh let me ask you for where the aspiration at your end lies uh for us i i think you know uh, we we don't want to play the numbers game you know uh, to be very honest for us uh, uh, the fact of the matter is that if we are able to actually look at you know the basics which is for microfinance and maybe add value to it with our uh, other products you know which go forward you know, because that is also the need which is now coming up you know because we look at our uh, borrowers you know who are in the fifth or the eighth cycle you know and they have taken 50,000 60,000 rupees now their aspiration goes on to uh, making the business grow bigger for us that is our next challenge which we have to really address too you know so we are looking at growth in the microfinance space but we are also looking at that plus plus, you know, which is there, you know, and we are probably coining that as in our organization that you know, we're looking at microfinance plus plus uh, as 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 a continuity to what microfinance has. You know. Well, uh, on that note, gentlemen, we will uh, wrap up this conversation. Thank you very much for giving us a very comprehensive perspective on where things currently stand for the MFI industry in India. And more importantly, what the road ahead looks like. Mr. Nambiar, Mr. Singh, Rajat, appreciate your time here on The Making. Well, that's it then for this episode of The Making. But don't go anywhere because uh, in our continuing series, we will put the spotlight on SMEs, why Indian MSMEs need to go global, the reshaping of global supply chains and more. But for now, from all of us here on the team. Goodbye. Many thanks for watching.